finding better ways of communicating with our customers. And that's a, a major focus at Connexus right now. We've gone through some steps previously to upgrade computer systems, and now that things are up and running, reaching out and really improving customer communications is the next corporate-wide um, major initiative. So our little part of this is what we're going to talk about today. It's one tiny little piece. And uh, so my name's Hart Gilchrist. I'm a GIS analyst. And up at Conexus, uh, we're a relatively small group. We have a fair amount, a lot to do, just like anybody. Uh, so I get a, a breadth of things that I get to play with, basically. And it is playing. It's a lot of fun. Um, I'm not limited in the, in the analyst world. Uh, we're a Schneider ESRI shop, so uh, I'm involved with doing all the store displays, all the ArcFM configuration files, uh, SQL server management, um, training for everybody, GIS evangelizing within the company, all sort of basic analyst responsibilities as well. So I get to have my fingers in a lot of pots, which makes it a lot of fun. So, uh, Connexus Energy is a the largest co-op in Minnesota. We're about 75 years old, 130,000 meters. <laughs> about 100,000 square miles across seven counties of the north and northwest metro of the Twin Cities. So ranges from some fairly dense urban first tier suburbs to hobby farm to very rural. So interesting uh, you know, density issues with how to display data and, and manage. So. Partner introduce himself. All right, here. thanks Art. Um, so like I said, um, my name's Jeff Mertz from SSP Innovations. Um, Currently, a director of technology and a principal consultant. Uh, that just basically means I get to do uh, more work than anybody else. Um, <laughs> so we do all kinds of stuff with upgrades and uh, system improvements and customizations. And and like I mentioned earlier, uh, we've been getting a lot into the GIS integrations because of this whole uh, system of engagement that's going on with the customers and how they want to report outages and see outages on a public-facing map and things like that. Um, so a little bit about SSP, in case you don't know um, who we are. We're uh, about 11 years old. Uh, we're actually, it's actually older than that, um, but 11 years marks the time when we actually started doing full-time GIS um, work for our customers. Um, one thing that we're very proud of is uh, we're very aligned with Esri, and because of that, in our ArcGIS Online, we've um, actually won two uh, years in a row for an Esri uh, partner conference. Um, award and that's on there so that's pretty cool um, we do work in the utility telecom space primarily uh, we do get into mostly electric but um, also a little bit of gas and water as it comes up depending on the size of the utility and what they're doing um, so when I started there um, just over five years ago we had about uh, 20 customers and about uh, nine employees and so now we've grown to uh, over 30 employees and 80 customers as well. So um, it's been really good um, business for us, and there's a lot of utilities out there who like to do this kind of stuff, and that's why we're in business. I'm going to turn it back over to Hart, and he's going to talk about um, how we got to where we were um, for this project. So, nice little list of sort of the history of, of GIS at Conexus. Like, it's not the total history of GIS at Connexus. It's the history of ESRI-based and Schneider-based GIS at Connexus. And stepping back even farther than that 2013 date, there was this whole massive computer infrastructure program going on at Connexus, and it involved virtually every computer system in the building from our outage management to GIS to the financial system <laughs> record, our out, you know, you know, workforce management, everything. All of it. It all got upgraded, and GIS was at the tail end of that. So the 2013 date, that happens to be this, the length of time I've been there as well. I actually arrived at Connexus the same day our data got that had been converted by Ramtech out of our legacy system. It arrived on the same day that I did. And I was the first person at the company who had any shred of experience with ESRI whatsoever. So all this data was converted with nobody consulting on exactly what a best practice would have been. And uh, there were some things that uh, maybe didn't, didn't go real well. So we sort of had uh, fits and starts there. That 2013 implemented. Well, we implemented, we had fits. We started, and then that start had fits. So you can see the first line of 2014 was a relaunch. We, uh, we stepped backwards, which was hard to admit, and hired some more people that sort of understood what was going on. 
I relaunched with an upgrade and got everything up and running. And from there, things have really taken off. So internal web math, um, mobile data in a completely disconnected state for our field crews, um, external integrations for our field locators. They're consuming web services that we produce. Um, Full-on integrations with our WMS and our CIS, getting data into SCADA. Um, SCADA doesn't really talk to a whole lot of people right now. They've got a double and triple firewalled off, so it's sneaker net to get data into it sometimes. Um, under 2015, in November, we stood up Responder as our outage management system of record. And at the same time, got sort of our first foot on the outside of the firewall with a public-facing outage map, which moves us to 2016. And since most of that computer upgrade in the company has, has ended for the most part, there's still pieces working on it, even after the project is supposed to have been done two years ago. But uh, the next corporate initiative, as I mentioned, was uh, customer communications. And that has taken hold at, from the highest levels on down, CEO. Uh, on, so using the information that we now have in our working GIS system, how can we improve customer communications? And our little piece here ties into outage management and allowing customers to get outage calls in without having to run through our IVR, without having to run through actually talking to a human being, because there's a number of people out there, like my kids, who would much rather text or anything like that than talk to someone live. So it tends to work well for them. So we're building, we have a customer portal that they, customers can opt into. One of the requirements for this reporting an outage was that any customer opt in or opt out on the customer portal could still submit and uh, create an outage ticket. So, and it says here we're ex leveraging existing middleware. And SSP had previously worked with Connexus on getting data to and from some of our mobile workforce, and we leveraged some of that into this new project. So, this is all marketing speak, basically, that says JD Power says if you can communicate with your customers better, they like you more. So, actually, yeah. The, uh, the higher-ups like to have us throw this in here and say that you're actually doing, you know, there's reasons why they're telling us to make these things happen, so. So more marketing speak, basically saying, how can customers get outages into the system easier? You know, and again, all customers. Doesn't matter whether they've opted in and signed in to the customer portal or not. So how do we get there? We have our friends at SSP leverage some of the work they've already done, and help us out. This is mine. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little out of place. Uh, so it, it, it connects this integration service. So um, as Hart mentioned back in 2015, um, they started, they implemented Responder, and they also um, contracted with Clevis for their mobile solution. And so the challenge was, how do we get this OMS information out to the field? And how do we update orders? And how do we say that outages have been restored? Um, so the first task for that was um, working with Clevist and coming up with uh, the service that would accept uh, their standard multi-speak 4.1 messages. So once we did that and got that project nailed out, this is the next um, step after that, how to expand that. And that was to do call ingest from the portal side. So um, as you can see here on the second bullet, they uh, already have a BizTalk server in-house that they're routing messages through. So uh, the, the basic premise was, how can we utilize that and the, and the, uh, the, the product that we, we delivered for the, for the mobile solution and leverage that and, and quickly come up with an, a solution to get calls inside of, inside of the OMS. So um, we do use the, uh, they use Schneider uh, Responder. So we're familiar with that. We've been working with that for many years. And uh, it was simply a matter of, um, using our previous knowledge and, and doing the call in jest um, with that. So that's where the, hopefully you can read this. I apologize if it's, um, or this, this came from the business side. <laughs> um, just go through this real quick. Um, so they have um, the member portal that Hart talked about. And um, when the members sign in and want to report an outage, um, that basically flows through, as we said, down through the firewall into their BizTalk server. Um, they use this for a variety of other things and will continue to do so in the future. There's some IVR um, up here and AMI as well down at the bottom. So the goal of this project was um, down here in the lower right 
is to get those um, multi-speak messages into Responder. Also, that's what's not listed on here is um, what's nice about this is there, sh there could be another line going out from OMS to the mobile. So you can see that customers can call in; it'll flow through the system into the OMS and then back out to the mobile side. So as I mentioned, uh, this is based on the uh, uh, Clevis Mobile Workforce Management. Um, it is using MultiSpeak 4.1. Um, it is a Windows service, um, so there's nothing tricky about this or custom. It's all out of the box uh, way of, of doing things these days. And uh, most importantly is um, Connexus are not really responder experts on the, on the guts and how it all works behind the scenes. They, they use it as, a, as an application so that they can manage their OMS. But it's difficult when you first install it, and you've had it for a year plus, a little less than a year now, fully yep. in production, um, to understand all the inner workings of it. So this bullet here is, is uh, very important that it shields them from all the intricacies and in how uh, the responder OMS works. And that's um, where SSP comes in. And we, we know all about their messaging framework and are able to um, talk back and forth to it with their services. Is this still me? This is still me. <laughs> All right, so uh, what we used is the OD event notification call, and that is uh, in, in MultiSpeak, that's a, a predefined um, message. Uh, so that it's basically really easy to go and work with another vendor and say, um, these are the fields we're going to use, this is the data that's going to come in, and we know what to expect. So there's not a lot of extra work to do to try and figure out what the message contract is going to be. And uh, we're, we're finding out. Um, with several other utilities that the multi-speak is, is becoming like a de facto is how to get uh, data in between different systems. Uh, we did do uh, one thing here with uh, specialized cause codes. So uh, like they use in their IVR system, Connexus uh, came up with some new codes uh, that are configured in the OMS, um, but they're basically a subset. And what that allows them to do is inside of inside of the responder, they're they can easily identify where the call originated from based on uh, the, the cause code that they used. So that lets the operators know, oh, this came from IVR, this came from the web. So that's one of the business requirements that they wanted to do. And we just basically configured that into the integration service, and that can be changed at any time. Uh, lastly, the call remarks. Um, again, if anything is entered by the customer on the portal, or for any other system, we have the ability to insert into those, and they can also view those in the OMS as well, so that nothing's lost. And back to Hart. Yeah, back to me. So a real quick um, demonstration of really how dead simple this is. Um, up on screen here is it's a screen scrape right off of our corporate website on the outage page, and rather than the big red easy button, we've got the great big yellow button right in the middle, report an outage. And then in smaller print, oh, by the way, you could call here. But um, really trying to channel some people into using the, the web, frees up IVR lines, and I think people like it just a whole lot better. When they do that, pops up just a real simple form. It's a single line on this case, enter the phone number. There's some checking behind the scenes to make sure that they're actually a customer in our system. They're not just generating numbers in here without uh, any sort of validation. And then it had address on there. And then a pick box. So this is um, says loss of power. I don't think you can read that. But there's a pick box of four or five different options of you know flickering, part power, um, low light, that kind of thing. And again, it, it works on a phone. It's really easy to deal with there. And not a lot of typing. A little bit of typing here allows um, people to put in some just generalized comments, what's going on, and a callback number. And both of these things. The system operators have turned out to really, really like this. The, uh, the comments themselves, we had one, someone literally typed in, uh, the lights flickered on and off, two second intervals on and off, and uh, the dispatcher, the guy who saw this was like, yeah, that's the recloser, it must be right there based on the address. Sent the truck out there, and diagnosis time was minuscule on that. And then a callback number is also real helpful in case we need to contact them again, and it has prevented truck rolls. Just in case, you know, if they have additional questions or something has resolved itself, the dispatcher can call and say, you know, and get back at them. 
So one thing we are working on right now and figuring out is if we can take this callback number and then re-ingest that back into our customer information system so we have current information from the customer at any given time. That's a, on a to-do list. So, And then the last page, it says you've successfully done this. And a little plug for safety, please stay away from down lines and you know, don't touch anything you shouldn't. And check us out on our outage map. So, and this brings up a, an interesting sort of unintended consequence of, you know, having these things go online. Our outage map is up and working, works just fine. But initially, we only display outages of 10 customers or more. So here we, we've told people now, report a single outage and go see it on the outage map. Well, we can't show them if there's just one of them. So it hasn't grouped up or anything like that. So one of my tasks very shortly after getting back here is to revise our um, outage map service to handle single individual outages so that they can see that it actually was successful. From the system operation from system operation side, Jeff had mentioned the different codes and being able to ingest the comments. I know nobody can read this over here, but in the box there, that's the comments. It's, it says generated by web, and then it tacks in whatever those comments were that the, the user typed in. They can now sort and group by some of these. The, the call code, or the cause codes are also used behind the scenes because um, we actually alert the system operators when the calls come in from the web. So our call takers, our system operators, are our first point of contact. They answer their own calls, except when storms come and then it falls over to the, the IVR. So our call take, our, excuse me, our system operators all basically know when calls come in. They've taken them or they're in the middle of storm events, and so they just deal with what's in front of them. What everybody was worried about was it'd be really, really quiet, they'd be doing their other tasks, and calls would be being generated from the web. So because of the custom call codes now, we can configure responder to alert, have an audible alerts, or change the line item colors in here based on codes. So anything that's generated from web now has an audible alert that comes in across the system operator's computer and highlights this in the system in their grid for a couple of minutes. So there's a visual and audible cue for when these calls can come in. Some of these benefits, um, calls get into the system a whole lot faster. Some of those IVR calls, you know, menu after menu after menu, people get frustrated with that. Um, customers seem to like it. It's easy to get through that portal. I'll take down other notes here that aren't on the system. So. We've been online for about two months with this. 17% of our outage calls are now coming in through this. So it's, it's taking hold and people are starting to use it. So I've already mentioned that the callback number and has prevented truck rolls. Um, and what's really, really nice is this is a, this is a framework. It's not a one-off talk from point A to point B. It's going to be able to be reused. I mean, it was reused once I mean, and leveraged for here. But so we're going to upgrade our IVR system by the end of the year. This system will be used again in that. Um, 2017 AMI installation, our uh, first 800 meters for AMI were installed uh, last month. No, I take that back. It was about eight days ago. So AMI is coming online. And when it gets up fully operational, we're going to reuse the service again to help ingest calls from that. So we've got a pretty flexible, fairly powerful integration tool to get data or customer information in and around our system in a fairly quick and uh, well streamlined manner. So we'll Great. take questions. Great. Um, so I guess you kind of kind of answered part of it. You said you guys have kind of, kind of got there with AMI. Do you guys are you guys as a plan to put in place a customer portal site with, with AMI and make like a single sign-on so that the customer has like Outage, they can log outages there and do um, look at their usage data and that kind of stuff. We're yeah. looking at something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So we're partnering up with MyMeter for basically customer portal information. And they can do a little bit of that now. It's going to become much, much more robust once AMI gets up and running and we can have all that consumption data. Um, and people opt in right now for that. We're not forcing anybody to go to it. This outage reporting basically launches from that MyMeter site, from that link that I showed you. But um, from a single sign-on, or is that like there's actually no sign-on? So we don't want anybody in our system, whether they've signed on to the portal or not, be able to throw an outage call up there. So it does some phone number and some address verification, but you don't have to be a member of the portal and actually log in to be able to throw calls through. So, 
Yeah, you look like you were thinking about it. I got one more. Sure. Did you guys build the? Did you guys build the outage interface on the website? For your? Um, on that part of? It? I I think so. <laughs> I wasn't involved in that okay. part of it, so. Um, the average reporting side. Yeah. Um, was was my meter involved with that? Yeah, or? my meter. I mean, they've yeah. got the initial site and um, stuff. Like that. Yeah, it's part it's part of the big future plan, I think, and so they were involved with just getting those initial screens going to, to ingest the outage call. But I think there's like Hart said, there's more to it than that coming yeah. down the road. Because we've got my meter doing their end. We've got at least one analyst, SQL analyst and programmer working on some of this on our side as well. And who actually created those screens? I don't know. Okay. So. Well, from beginning. Beginning to end, how long did it take to get this when up? Did, when did you fire up? Possibly four months, plus or minus. Um, the original project was scheduled for about two months, um, but what tends to happen in these is once you get testing and figure out and working with multiple vendors is, is really the key there because um, even though my side might be done and ready for testing, the, the front end portal wasn't ready yet, so we had to do a lot of intermediate test messages inside the biz talk part so that kind of extends the duration so if, if, if the portal was ready and we were ready all one time it, it, it's probably a 60 to 90 day project oh, I, just, I said that never happens with IT projects <laughs> we're also working with Trey now so he's probably going to second guess <laughs> all of my numbers now yeah. we're also, we also have, have Cloudex and their SSPs are actually working on an integration that similar to what they did over at Connection which is slightly different so. okay. the, the, obviously the, the uh, firewall is always that's an issue that because you know you hear it at our conference we're talking about all of this open stuff but can you talk a little bit more about some of the complexities of having to deal with the firewall and getting kind of dealing with that the whole security side of it? Ooh, I'm not your guy for that. You? They sent me because I'm the I'm the pretty face, but I'm not all that pretty. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, in terms of any, how about you? Uh, um, I, I, not for this project, um, but typically um, you do have to get IT buy-in for that. Um, so you have to allow those messages or that in, that integration endpoint on the inside of the firewall. And so, so what we like to do uh, as best practice is to just use. If you're using IIS, it's a default website. Um, it's running secure on, on port 443, and no extra fancy stuff with it. That way, they can lock everything else out except for that call that's coming in. Uh, typically, a lot of these are internal inside the firewall, uh, so a lot of times um, there'll be issues with, like uh, that was mentioned, the SCADA system is so blocked off that they can't even get a message through to the OMS side uh, because the, the networks are internally segregated. Uh, so there are issues with that, and again, using the web services is really nice because you only have to worry about that one port to get out, um, uh, 443, so mm -hmm. that's... Um, I mean, I was thinking in terms of, did it delay anything, or it was just, you, it didn't add a level of complexity? It, it typically kind of doesn't. You just, uh, with the way the work, it's, it varies by, by utility, and sometimes um, IT and GIS don't get along. You probably all know about that. Um, so it's just a matter of coordination and, and getting them to understand what's going on and what traffic is being passed, um, so that you feel confident that um, this is something that they can do. Yeah. And the reason why I mention that, because that's always, because people really want to get access to the SCADA system and that's, you know, there's, some, there's some, always some issues associated with that, particularly around security. Not, to, not, not from an ability to get it, it's just all getting through the whole security. Yeah, and the multi-speak, to follow up on that, the multi-speak header uh, does allow for um, authentication. Um, we don't typically uh, use it because everything is contained inside the firewall, but that capability is there to make sure that your messages are authenticated and coming from trusted sources as well. This is it. Go ahead. Now we get some questions. <laughs> We do something similar, but we've got a little protection. We, you can sign in with your phone number and your house number so we don't get somebody just scripting all our phone numbers. Right. Do you have any protection in there? To there is some behind the scene checking to see that it's a valid phone number and, and address. Yeah. So. Oh, they, do they have to type in the address? That, that is one of the line items. It's the second line item after the phone number. So. The customers have to type it in. Yes. There yeah, was I think you, you accidentally yes. just got I, I think it was clear. Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. I want to show what you asked about SCADA storing information. Now you mentioned multi speak. How about could you consider ICCP? Or, I haven't seen any project where GIS is talking with SCADA using ICCP. But would there be some consideration where we receive real time information? That's what we do in yes. Denmark. Yeah. Thank you with the RGIS. 
Yeah, well, with, with, with Responder, it communicates through our ICCP server and SCADA. And yes. the second question was about the single channel. There was one in context of consumer portal. When you say single channel, as in they can report outage, they can see all the billing information. I, I, I didn't catch that. Yeah, this fellow here? I think it was a trade, single sign on to the portal. Yeah. yeah. So that was more in context of not yeah. the corporate environment single sign but for the consumer. Yeah, so one of the things we've been talking about and did a lot is how is looking at the customer side of it. So we're looking trying to get provide AMI data to our customers and so they can see all their AMI meter data, 50 minute interval data. But on top of that they can go to one sign in, they can also plug in their outage if they want to at that point. They can also um, pay a bill at that point too. Uh, so there's, we have like a, <coughs> there's a lot of security reports when you talk about paying your bill and go to single sign-on stuff. So we, we kind of have to sort out some detail to figure some of that out. And that's the kind of the way that we're probably going to take to approach to secure how people are reporting outages through that portal. So that we don't just get anything come through there. Okay. Uh, any more questions? I, I heard there was one reference to multi-speak. Does everybody in the room know what that means? Or does anybody in there not know what that means? Multi-speak is an interoperability standard that's used by co-ops. It's just basically, it's a, sta it's a standard that was built well, several years ago for, uh, by NRECA, the, uh, the National, the Rural, National Rural, Rural, Rural Electric. Electric. Yeah. yeah, they built a standard for so that OMS and GIS and SCADA. So <coughs> but it's not just co-ops anymore using it. It's everybody's using it. Uh, yeah, there's also something called common information model, SIM, in an international standard, so they're, yeah. they're button heads a little bit. But all, all of our integrations are multi-speed. They're from our municipal. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And that's what yeah. JMI across the board is multi-speed. Yeah. And I used to. have a hybridization for you now, so I just keep moving. You actually have some set of SIM. Yeah, I, I think you'll see multi-speed and SIM kind of harmonize. Yeah. yeah. You'll see it someday. But anyway, any more questions? Thank you so much. How about a round of applause for our speaker? <laughs>